stealth technology, the internet, GPS in the palm of your hand, autonomous operation. Technology is a driver of our times. Since its founding in 1958 in the midst of the Cold War, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, has been a driver of technology. Welcome to Voices from DARPA, a window onto DARPA's core of program managers. Their job? To redefine what is possible. My name is Ivan Amato, and I'm your DARPA host. Today, I am pleased to be talking with Alexander Wallen, a program manager since 2017 in the agency's Tactical Technology Office. We are recording our conversations from our respective locations to comply with COVID-19 restrictions. Because we are not in a recording studio, you might hear ambient sounds like traffic and birds, and as it so happens, insect noises from this year's brood of 17-year cicadas, which are just everywhere here in my mid-Atlantic location. Alexander, or Xander, as he is more often known, brought to DARPA his interests in developing and demonstrating advanced aircraft technologies, rapid design and prototyping for moving concepts as quickly as possible to operational practicality are also parts of his modus operandi. Xander has had his hands on the challenge of vertical landing and takeoff or VTOL technologies and demos of lighter than air aircraft that are capable of being navigable and having extended flight at stratospheric altitudes at 11, 12 miles and above that. His main programmatic focus today is with the program known as CRANE, short for Control of Revolutionary Aircraft with Novel Effectors. Before joining DARPA's team of program managers, Xander served for 22 years as an officer in the Air Force, beginning in 1995 and stretching all the way to 2017 when he began his DARPA years. Just before joining DARPA, he served as a program manager at the Air Force Research Lab where he oversaw a broad technology portfolio of over 70 projects designed for transition to the warfighter. He also held positions in the F-35 Joint Program Office and the Combined Joint Task Force Paladin, which between 2005 and 2013 helped manage the threat of improvised explosive devices in the war in Afghanistan. He also worked in the Office of the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition. And as he will tell you later, he has had quite the adventure in getting close-up looks at aircraft of other nations, including China. Xander has four degrees. Three of them are in aeronautical engineering, including a doctor of engineering degree from George Washington University. His fourth degree is an MBA from the University of Massachusetts. One more thing. Xander is a new father with a 10-week-old baby girl. Alexander Wallen, though I shall call you Xander from here on out, thank you for joining me in this discussion and a huge congratulations on your new baby daughter. Well, thank you very much. It's great to be here. Xander, before we talk about your technology development work at DARPA, I would like to get some sense of how you became the sort of person that ends up as a DARPA program manager. Uh, I can tell from your three aeronautical engineering degrees that flying technologies were on your mind by the time you were an undergraduate at the University of Minnesota. What can you tell me about the influences in your life, whether at home or at school, you know, just if you had mentors that uh, led to uh, this interest? Well, thank you. That, uh, that's a great question. I, I think I come by this via my father. Uh, so growing up every year, my father would pile us and my three sisters and my brother into the car when we go to the Chicago Air and Water Show and watch the Blue Angels or the Thunderbirds and, and watch all sorts of airplanes. Um, and I think from about the time I was in fifth grade and beyond, the only gifts I wanted for Christmas or my birthday were encyclopedias of military airplanes. Um, so I, I've always been interested in flight. My father used to take me to uh, go watch the Warburgs land at the local airport when they do flyovers and air shows. Um, so I really inherited it from him, a love of airplanes. Uh, and then as I graduated high school, and went into college, I knew I wanted to be an engineer. And so I, I just put those two together and been studying aircraft and flight and that sort of thing since. Now, uh, during your education, you also added in a master's in business administration. I'm assuming that this is a clue to uh, what you kind of had in mind for the long haul vision of what you wanted to do professionally. As a young officer in the Air Force, I was managing relatively small programs. And I noticed my counterparts in industry, uh, I was always interested in the technology, but, but they had all these other concerns. They had to manage budgets, they had to manage people, they had to worry about accounting. And so I actually wanted to understand that side of it, the business side of it, of running a program. Uh, and so I started my MBA and found out I loved finance, I loved the accounting aspect. 
I study economics in my spare time now. So I got into it initially to understand the other side of the table as I was managing programs. And then turned out I, I love that part of it as well. And I think it's helped inform how I craft programs because I've kind of got an understanding of what the contractor and what my counterpart in industry has to deal with above and beyond just the technology challenges. When I saw that uh, you had that MBA degree, I was thinking, well, you know, that has got to be really helpful in your role at DARPA because, you know, sort of as I have gotten to know program managers and what that role is, I mean, it is like you're running a, a corporate entity, a full-fledged corporate entity where, you know, the kinds of issues of just running a business and, and staying on budget and all of the uh, logistics of that, you know, are, are part of it. It's not just finding cool uh, people who do cool technology, but it's also managing all that. So the MBA just seems like a perfect addition to the technical training. I think it is. And, and also things like market research and marketing. You know, it's one thing to to have a great idea, but to be able to sell it and get people excited about it. And market research, understanding what else is going on and how you fit into a marketplace, whether that's a new weapon or a interesting piece of technology. So those are the type of things I, I strove to learn as uh, when I was at UMass. And I think I've tried to incorporate that background into my projects. So now let's move to your DARPA adventure. And I always love to hear the how I got to DARPA story. I asked that of almost all of the program managers that I've spoken with for this podcast. So let me ask you, I mean, did you seek out a job at DARPA? Did someone at DARPA seek you out? How'd you get here? Uh, so a little bit of both. So uh, when I returned from Afghanistan in 2009, I'd spent 10 months doing counter improvised explosive device work. We were fielding new technology. It was long hours. It was tiring. It was exciting. And I went back to my old job in the Pentagon. And after about a month, I went to my boss and said, this job is a lot duller and easier than I remember. Do you have anything tougher? And he had just gotten a call from DARPA looking for a deputy program manager. And so I set up an interview, and it turns out the day of the interview, there was a snowstorm. I happened to live six blocks away from DARPA at the time. So I walked six blocks in a snowstorm to do an interview with the TTO office director. And uh, at the time, it was uh, I wasn't even sure what I was interviewing for, but I was excited. And uh, so I ended up being a deputy program manager for two years at DARPA uh, while on active duty. Transitioned, went to work some other Air Force assignments, finished out my career. But, but from that point forward, I knew that's where I wanted to come back. And so I had the opportunity to re-interview as a civilian uh, and get hired on in 2017 after my Air Force retirement. Thanks for letting me know about that entry in, into the agency. I uh, love the detail with the snowstorm. So in 2017, as you just said, you joined DARPA's Tactical Technology Office. Now, more than any uh, office, that office develops technologies that move, you know, whether on the ground, in the sea, in the air, in space. And in one of the now completed programs you worked on, so let's talk about the past a little bit first before we talk about Crane, your current program. Uh, that one was called the Adaptable Lighter Than Aircraft Program, or ALTA. And it did get some attention in 2019 when people across the country were craning their necks uh, and reporting strange white dots high overhead. The agency posted on Facebook in late June of that year, 2019, that three test balloons had managed to uh, navigate from east to west across the country, beginning in Cumberland, Maryland, and then uh, ended uh, with safe landings in northern California. So can, can you briefly explain uh, the technology need that uh, Alta was designed to meet and, um, and tell me what you can about what it achieved? And uh, although I'm piling questions on here, I'm also interested to know uh, what you were thinking when you know, reports were coming in from around the country about these sightings way up. Let's start actually with what the program you know, was about and what technology need you had hoped it would uh, deliver. And then what is its status now? Right. So the, so the Alta program, I was I was lucky enough to inherit that. So a previous program manager had started that. And as I came on, I worked as a deputy for a few months and then took that program over. And what we were trying to do there is do a low cost stratospheric vehicle. So a stratosphere typically above 60,000 feet. There's big advantages if you're going to get a flying vehicle up there. Uh, commercial airliners don't fly up there. And as you get from 60 to 70 to 90,000 feet, you get, a, get to, to view a lot of the Earth from up there. So it's, we call them pseudo-satellites or pseudolites. Right. And just for context, we're, we're, we're probably talking here 11, 12 miles and above, right? 
Absolutely, yes. Um, so the air is very thin up there, and it's you build these uh, lighter than air vehicles almost more like a spacecraft than you do an aircraft because the air is very thin. Um, so from a low cost communication, precision navigation, and timing, and a low cost uh, surveillance platform that was very, very appealing to the military services. Um, so we we did this program, and we actually did a test flight about a year before that that graduation exercise where it flew across the country. For that flight, we flew out of Utah, small airport, uh, and as the balloons were going aloft and we were taking pictures, you know, we began to notice that uh, they randomly appear and disappear based on the sun and the clouds. They're very large vehicles, hundreds of feet across, but they're very far away, so it's very disorienting. And a couple of the engineers and I looked at each other and said, someone's going to think that's a UFO. So, so uh, we sort of suspected that was going to happen. So we were very, tried to be very forthcoming. We, we filed with the FAA. We did social media posts saying, we're going to go do this. And the, really the only bet was how far across the country would it get before the first UFO sighting? I think we made it all the way to Dayton, Ohio before we got our first UFO sighting. So, so that was fun, but, uh, but we actually participated with the Army on that. Uh, we had ground units uh, doing communication exercises while we were going over the U.S., and we had specific points we were navigating to. From a military technology, I think we demonstrated a very low-cost, reactive way to sort of supplement satellites and build a local network almost anywhere in the world, and the ability to fly a constellation from one continent uh, across um, so, so I think we were very successful, and, and I know that both the Army and the Navy have activities that are building on our success. Great. So some chance of or already some degree of transition to potential end users, users. That's always the trophy that DARPA wants with its programs. I want to dwell on Elsa just a bit more because there's one very cool aspect of the technology that I just want to hear a little bit more about. And that's just the, the navigation aspect. Because if I recall, one way that you achieve navigation is by changing the altitude of the balloons in order to take advantage of, uh, you know, sort of different air currents and conditions at different altitudes. A am I right about that? And if so, just tell us a little bit more how that works. Yeah, so the, the fundamental theory of why you can navigate with these balloons is that the winds in the stratosphere are, are very chaotic and turbulent. And so you'll have winds going one direction and then a few thousand feet above or below, they'll actually be going the other direction. And so if you know what they're doing, you can kind of, you can change your altitude by moving, basically pumping air from the outside into the balloon and it, you can make it go up or down. Uh, we call it zero mass because we're not actually changing the, the mass of the vehicle. We're bringing air on or venting it off. And then the complementary piece of that is, well, you want to know the winds aloft. So we actually also developed a winds aloft sensor that uses a laser and actually measures the molecule movement of the air at 75,000 feet and above. And to do that, we took a piece of technology that NASA demonstrated that weighed about 1,500 pounds and it was the size of a dining room table and shrunk it down to something about the size of a coffee can that weighed 50 pounds. And we demonstrated a low power, eye safe, satellite safe laser that could actually measure winds at 75,000 feet and above. And it uh, could actually then, you could use that data and figure out if you wanted to ascend or descend depending on which direction you wanted to go. Wow, it's amazing to think about a vehicle that size yet that can maneuver up and down in the atmospheric column to take advantage of different wind conditions as they arise. Really, truly amazing. Now, let's move on to another program you had worked on, this one that had the goal of delivering an aircraft prototype capable of VTOL, that is vertical takeoff and landing, like it has never been done before. Xander, what were you hoping to achieve with this program? Great question. So, so we actually had a, a program called VTOL X or Lightning Strike that was supposed to do a high speed vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. And by high speed, 300 to 350 knots, which is about 150 knots faster than a helicopter or something like a, a V 22 tilt rotor. At the end of the day, that program ended up not going to flight, we ran into challenges uh, with electric hybrid propulsion. And, and, and that's an area that actually got a lot of active investment in both the commercial and the government side. I think we, we advanced the technology a fair amount on that program. Um, but that's a, that's a great example of a program that, that didn't 
end up completing its initial mission, but we actually discovered where the technology needed to advance. And we spent uh, and worked with industry to, to, to push some of the generator technology and, and some of the some of the underlying technologies that would enable that kind of aircraft in the future. So, so we continue to, to work with folks and support the Air Force and their Agility Prime endeavor, but the high-speed fixed wing combines all the attributes you'd like in a helicopter with the efficiency of a traditional aircraft, um, and that's still something that, uh, that is out there to go do. And so we advance some of the technology, but uh, that's an area we're still looking at um, what's the right configuration and what technologies have to mature before we're ready for a leap in capability. Right. And, you know, what I loved about your description there was that it really does touch upon one of the signature aspects of the DARPA model, which is to take on extremely challenging technology problems with the hope, you know, that you actually will get to the technology finish line that you envision ahead of time, but also with the understanding that if you don't, you learn all along the way that there's a value to that and that helps you point in the direction or point away from what would otherwise be uh, dead ends so that in the end it, it helps to uh, you know, accelerate um, a technology vision to, to a good finish line. Let me now zero in on your current program, Crane, Control of Revolutionary Aircraft with Novel Effectors. In July, the agency announced the first three awards in the program. And uh, I'm going to let you talk about it, but I think in short, the idea is to deploy what is called active flow control, uh, such that one can steer an aircraft without the need of movable surfaces. Tell us the story of the crane program, uh, the problem, need, or capability that you envision it will address, and, uh, and what is the status of the program? When I was uh, starting the crane program and, and selling it through my leadership, I used the example of an F-35 versus a World War One aircraft. And I said, if you took an aeronautical engineer from, from 1914 and showed him an F-35, he could do all the equations and tell you how, to, how far to move the tail, left, right, the rudders. How we control airplanes has not fundamentally changed in over 100 years. Now, that engineer from 1914 would have no idea how the jet engine worked. He wouldn't understand radar, any of the electronics. But fundamentally, we're still designing airplanes the same way we did 100 years ago. And that's by moving little bits of airfoil up and down or left and right. And that works pretty well. But what you find is from a design point of view, it really limits your imagination. And, and, and so what we wanted to do with Crane was take a technology, in this case, active flow control, which is basically blowing little bits of air over the wing at strategic locations. And that technology has been in the lab and in wind tunnels and been in academia for over 30 years. And we wanted to create a program that forced aircraft designers to think differently and to work on the tools and the methodology to develop new and novel ideas and give them the time and space to do that. And so that's what we tried to do on Crane is, is really give the designers the freedom to think outside the box. And, uh, and one of the, the ways we did that is we specifically said at the beginning of the program, don't come to us with an idea of what the airplane should look like. We're going to spend the first year doing experiments, doing wind tunnels, doing high power computing. We want to examine dozens of different ideas and then as a group decide what's the most compelling demo, what should the airplane look like? And I, I think that was unusual. I had to plead with my leadership to give me more time up front. And I said, if we go slow in the beginning, we'll get a much better product and be able to go faster at the end. Xander, so you are really just getting this program's momentum going, and it sounds like it's uh, the first year is going to be really gathering ideas and then bringing the teams together, performers together to think about what would be the good next steps to take. So, But as you just sort of game out the entire program, schematically, what do you expect will happen? How will it unfold? Right. So that's a, that's a great question. So we're about a year into the program. We're 11 months in. We've had three contractors who have started with over a dozen different ideas and concepts of what airplanes should look like. Uh, we have spent the last 11 months doing wind tunnel testing, doing high power computing, building brand new tools, and, and kind of working as a team to develop these new revolutionary concepts. Over the next month or so, we're going to start down selecting to one or two ideas. And then those will go in from what we are currently in, which we call phase zero into phase one. And that is where we'll actually do the preliminary design of the flying air vehicle. We'll start doing drawings, we'll identify subsystems, 
And then you start to get an idea really of what those airplanes will look like and what they'll demonstrate. And the things we're gonna demonstrate is, we think with this technology, we can make airplanes lighter. We can potentially do new and interesting uh, maneuvers. And not only can we change the way we design them and the way they look, but we can actually show improvements in weight and range and takeoff capability by thinking outside the box and, and applying this new technology. And so we'll, we'll do that. And then from there, we'll probably down select a single airplane and then we'll do the detailed design, we'll start construction, and then in three to four years, we'll actually have flying prototype out uh, flying and demonstrating some of these breakthroughs. Yeah, you know, this is also reminding me a little bit of hydrodynamics and maybe aerodynamics in nature a little bit. You know, I'm thinking of things like the like shark skin, I know, that has these little denticles, uh, you know, which are all about sort of controlling eddy flows and turbulence and that sort of thing. And it makes the, the shark a much more efficient swimmer. Are there any biological analogies that uh, some of your performers are bringing into the mix? Yeah, so that, that's really interesting because that's one of the one of the things you find early on is early in aviation, we tried to mimic birds. And it wasn't until the Wright brothers basically broke out propulsion separate from lift that we were able to achieve flight. And then over the past hundred years, what we found is that the, the birds actually know what they're doing because they, they can, with very small changes to their wings, uh, especially soaring birds, if you ever watch a hawk or an eagle, uh, you know, very slight changes, they can, they can do great maneuvers um, with very little energy. And so, so we've actually got some concepts that sort of borrow that idea that, that rather than brute force, you know, using big pieces of metal moving up and down, that if you effectively just change the way the air appears, you know, make little, little changes to the air, you can, you can maneuver in what I'd call a more elegant manner. And so it's, it's taken about 100 years to go from where we started trying to mimic birds to actually getting back to where we have the technology the computing resource to actually model how to do that because it's it's much more challenging when you try to try to do that than one would think but there are real advantages to the way nature has evolved that that we're only now actually being able to sort of mimic Okay, just a couple of more questions, and then I will uh, bring our discussion, as it were, in for a landing. Forgive me for that. I'm also just sort of imagining uh, little Xander, uh, forgive me for that too, but several decades ago, and you're going to these air shows, and you're probably screaming things like, wow, that's cool, to your dad. And then now here you are, a DARPA manager, I mean, working on, you know, seriously cool technology, obviously things that could have some value in the context of defense, but, you know, sort of this idea of, of a new way of of producing or creating uh, navigation in the air. But when you allow yourself to sort of imagine the coolest technologies that you've dreamt about, even if they're not DARPA uh, related, I mean, what comes to mind? Like what kind of aeronautical technologies have you dreamt about that you wish could be so, but are not yet? For me personally, the most exciting thing out there, the, the thing that uh, you know we've all been promised are where are our jetpacks, right? And so we actually did get, I did get approval and we have a small business initiative to look at what we call battlefield personal mobility. So the idea is if I'm a soldier and I wanna move five or 10 miles, is there a way I can do that without being on the roads and point to point through the air? And so we're gonna do several small awards to look at, at some innovative things to include personal uh, quiet paragliders, personal little helicopters and potentially some version of jetpacks in a military context to say, if I need to move five or 10 miles, can soldiers get off the roads, get a, get away from large vehicles and move around freely? So that's sort of a really exciting thing. And, and, and there's some technology that's just now emerging that might make that more practical. We've got a lot of work in high powered uh, batteries. We've got your ubiquitous now quadcopter or drone. You know, those things can scale up potentially to be something that's man portable and can transport people. So still not there, but I think if, if you can do the personal mobility where you basically carry your own little vehicle and are able to, to move around five or 10 miles, I think that that's a really exciting kind of opportunity. Well, that gets a just wow from me because, you know, the jetpack 
comes up even in, in a lot of correspondence with DARPA. It's sort of like, okay, you can do A, you can do B. What about the jetpack? So, uh, Xander, if you end up helping to deliver the jetpack, I think your name will go down quite well in the, the history of DARPA, probably the history of, of technology in general. So may you succeed in, in helping to deliver the jetpack. Shifting direction just a bit, I'd like to ask you to reflect on your experience as a DARPA program manager in a place, DARPA, which is so notable in the overall innovation ecosystem. Uh, you know, this is kind of an interesting time to ask the question because there's just tons and tons of discussion, both domestically and in other countries, about trying to emulate DARPA, whether it's in I mean, energy and intelligence, there, there are already are ARPAs there. But even in the Department of Transportation, there's a proposal now to create a transportation-centric ARPA, Advanced Research Projects Agency. So I'm just wondering, you know, in your opinion, what are some of the institutional and cultural characteristics of DARPA that you think will be most challenging for others to emulate or replicate? I'm lucky in that I've had the opportunity uh, while at DARPA to work uh, a couple uh, projects with foreign governments, um, friendly nations who are talking about setting up their own DARPAs. And, and they often ask me the same question. I think there's two things, at least that I've seen, that are, that are really enabling and motivating. The first is as program managers, we know we're on a short time limit. Typically, two to five years we have to, to start a project, project and, and get it moving and, and really do, do exciting work. And then after that, we're going to be basically thanked, have to go find another job, and then someone will come in. And so what that means is, one, you're very motivated to take an idea, refine it, and make sure it's really ready to go and that you can execute it in a timely fashion. And the second thing, if it's a more complicated project and it's going to take a little bit longer, you really are motivated to, to make sure that it's on solid footing because the person coming next behind you to take that program over may not love it as much as you love it, right? So it's got to be, it's got to really be compelling and it's got to be solid technically. And that sort of leads in the second, I think, enabling thing that DARPA does is we're not afraid to fail and we're not afraid to basically stop a program midway through and say, you know what, this was harder than we thought. Let's take a step back and, and we're going to stop doing this and maybe think about a better way to do it. And I think, you know, we, we do that in TTO a fair amount, but we also have our, our big successes. And so we're willing to, to invest in things that, that we think are disruptive. And we're also willing to, to take chances that may not pan out. Uh, and that's a lot easier said than done. And being willing to fail and knowing that you won't be looked at as a failure if the program runs into technical issues, that's a success, that you've discovered a new technology roadblock that you can go work. Thanks for sharing some of your insights and observations about the innovation culture at DARPA. I especially like the way you describe the positive value that the agency ekes from, you know, both delivering on an original technology vision, but also from discovering roadblocks that still must be overcome, you know, to reach the finish line. Uh, so very cool to hear about that. And now, uh, before we do close, I do want to just revisit a little bit your Air Force career before coming to DARPA. Can you just share a little bit more about that? Sure. I was an Air Force officer for 22 years, primarily engineering focused. Uh, I had a, a really fun opportunity as my first assignment. I was sent to the National Air and Space Intelligence Center where I was a Chinese fighter aircraft analyst. So I got to look at foreign aircraft and try to deduce their capabilities and had the opportunity as a second lieutenant to attend the first ever Chinese public air show in 1996. And that sort of sealed the deal that uh, I, you know, before I loved airplanes. And so I got to, to look at foreign aircraft and then, then move over and uh, worked F-117 and B-2. I uh, had the opportunity to do that during Allied Force when we lost an F-117 uh, and got to participate and, and figure out why that happened and how to avoid it. Since that, I uh, had the opportunity to work on a, a lot of fixed wing aircraft, some special mission things. And one of the, the things I think the Air Force really offered me an opportunity is I got a new job every three or four years. And I got to take new challenges and, and work a variety of programs in a variety of their life stages and try to take all of that background knowledge and pile it into, into this four-year tour at DARPA to figure out what went well, what doesn't go well, and where the gaps are in capability. 
So I had a great opportunity in the Air Force. They, they gave me a lot of opportunity every three or four years to get a brand new challenging job. And that's one of the things that excited me about DARPA is it's, it's very similar. You've got a very fixed window. You've got a clear authority. They get the, the, the backing of your boss and you're, you're told to go do something amazing. Xander, what a a great conversation. Um, You have taken my imagination aloft. Thank you so much for sharing this time with me. Well, it's been a pleasure. And uh, there's few things in life I like talking about more than my, uh, my programs or my new baby girl. So thank you for the opportunity. Well, the best of luck to you and your wife in uh, raising this new life you brought into the world. And I also want to thank you listeners for lending us your ears. I hope you join us again for the next Voices from DARPA. Thanks also to Tom Shortridge for his partnership in producing this program. For more information about Alexander Wallen, the programs he and his colleagues in the Tactical Technology Office, or TTO, run, and the many other breakthrough technologies DARPA is working on, visit DARPA.mil. And for links that enable you to download this podcast, go to the Voices from DARPA page on DARPA's website.